Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, Editor-at-Large at The Hub. I'm honored to be joined by David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly podcast and video series, From Dialogues. David, as listeners and viewers will know, is a staff writer at The Atlantic, the author of several books, and a highly coveted guest and commentator on various cable television programs. We're honored to provide him with a platform to share his insights and analysis on key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. In today's episode, we're marking the two-year anniversary of COVID-19 lockdowns and the pandemic's long-term consequences, specifically in regard to the West's relationship with China. David, thanks again for joining me, as always. Always such a pleasure. Well, this week marks the two-year anniversary of the declaration of a state of emergency in parts of Canada. We now know that the first known cases in China were weeks and even months earlier. There are also studies that estimate that if, China, if the Chinese government had acted earlier, including limiting travel elsewhere, we may have avoided a global pandemic. Are you surprised that there hasn't been more international scrutiny or criticism of China's response? And if so, what do you attribute that to? Um, well, I attribute it to, to two things. The first is um, uh, something of the, the, the false lead uh, provided by President Trump um, at, in the early part of the pandemic, where he tried to make this a, a malicious rather than a negligent act by China, um, and to suggest actually that uh, as, as a way of avoiding blame for his own mismanagement, to make to suggest that China had somehow deliberately, intentionally done this to the world. Um, we uh, we have a long history of pandemic diseases originating in China um, because um, of many practices in China, Chinese food management and other things. Um, uh, the, you know, the flus and, and other diseases have a way of originating there. It's, it's strange how um, India, for example, which is a country as crowded and as poor as China, has not been an incubator of infectious disease. We don't talk about Bombay flus in the way that we have talked about Asian, Asian flus, meaning chi Chinese flus. Um, so that's been a, a, a chronic problem. The United States and partners met it by having, uh, by developing a, a big presence inside China. Um, and the Trump administration agreed to allow that to be dismantled. The Chinese wanted it to be dismantled because they didn't like being surveilled, but the, the uh, Trump people went along with it. Um, and then embarrassed, um, they then ramped up the accusations in ways that uh, didn't look very credible. Now, um we're talking about the long-term consequences of the pandemic experience. One of those consequences in, in the minds of some is an exacerbation of the growing geopolitical and technological rivalry between the West and China. Some have even described these growing tensions as a new Cold War. Yeah. What do you think of that framing, David? Is it useful or does it risk obscuring more than it clarifies? Um, I, I am a increasingly strong advocate of a need to um, – do everything in our power to maintain the friendliest possible, most normal possible relationship with China. I mean, I, I've, hmm. it's strange. Um, you know, I, uh, 20 years ago, uh, I was someone who was very, very worried about China um, at a time when very few people seem to be. And, and then I find myself, you know, steadily driving in my lane at my constant 50 mile an hour level of worry and being irritated that, uh, you know, the, the I, I was stuck in traffic and then suddenly everyone is whizzing past me at 80. You think, no, the, the goal was to be moderately worried, but always to continue to hope for the best because look, China, China's lifting of hundreds of millions of its own people out of intense poverty. That's an accomplishment. China rejoining the world economy, even if in the kind of um, often adversarial ways that it has rejoined it, that, that, that is a welcome development. We are all pr prosperous and, and, and safer and, um, and happier than we were if China had remained poor. We have additional problems because of Chinese growth, especially environmental problems. Um, but it is worth every effort to maintain um, open trade, international cooperation, discussions about climate, um, and not to, not to choose a conflict. The original Cold War was very much a choice by the Soviet Union against the West. Um, chi if, chi if, if there is to be a new Cold War, let it be China's choice and not ours. Hmm. That's interesting, David. As you mentioned, um, there are growing questions in the minds of some policy observers, politicians, and others about some of the initial assumptions about yeah. um, greater economic integration and cooperation with China. The ascension to the World Trade Organization in the early 2000s is often cited 
um, as uh, something in hindsight yeah. that was a mistake. Um, in, in your view, uh, what do you think about uh, these past decisions? Did we get them wrong? Or as you say, on balance, is yeah. uh, greater integration and, and economic collaboration with China on net better, even if it's come at the expense of, of climate issues you mentioned, the so-called China shock and its implications for manufacturing employment in parts of the U.S. and elsewhere? Were those costs worth it? Um, relative yeah. to the alternative. I, I don't agree with the criticism uh, at all. I don't at all agree with the criticism of the decision to admit China to the WTO. Um, hmm. what, the, what the critics do is they look at some of the hopes that were expressed at the time about what might eventuate and assume, well, the, the, the highest hopes for China were the reasons for the Chinese admission. China had to be, it, it was this growing trade partner. It's you know, this huge portion of humanity, of course you had to bring it into a global trade regime, regime and you should want to. Um, and then, yes, it, uh, many people hope for happier results, um, hope for a more accommodating relationship with China than we got. Um, but it was still a good thing to do, even if it wasn't as good a thing as the most optimistic people would have hoped back, uh, back at the time that decision was made. Um, you know, we need to try to keep trading normally with China, and we need to welcome that China is becoming wealthier. Um, and we need to maintain the peace in, in the Pacific, which I think is something that can be done through the strength of allied partnerships. China has had a warning from this, uh, from the consequences of the Russian war in Ukraine that um, uh, aggressive wars don't go well. Uh, for authoritarian states. They really don't. Um, and uh, that authoritarian states often, um, whatever economic power they may have, and China's a lot, that is not the same as the financial power that is held by governments that enjoy the trust of, of the world in the way that the governments of the democratic West do. Um, so I, I think, you know, we are um, a little disappointed, all of us properly so, uh, by some of the things that have happened over the past 20 years. But to roll back the WTO agreement, that, 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 that makes no sense to me. Um, the China shock uh, is all, hit, landed on many manufacturing communities in the United States, Canada, around the world. But the China shock has also enriched people in all kinds of ways. It, it, China buys goods and services and products. Um, it makes possible bigger market. Uh, the Chinese um, entry or return to the world market has bid up the price of capital assets. I mean, houses and, and shares and corporations are more valuable than they would be if China had not rejoined the world economy. Um, so we, uh, and if you've got a plan for prosperity that locks out China, India, and others, that's not a very good plan. You have to have a plan for world prosperity that brings them in. As part of this um, rethinking about uh, the West economic and geopolitical relationship with China, we've increasingly um, seen um, from both the left and right, but in, but notably from conservatives, a, yeah. a call for something resembling an industrial policy. I, I note, for instance, uh, National Review editor Rich Lowry wrote last week for the need for, quote, new economic thinking. Um, yet in a May 20, 2021 article for The Atlantic, you, yeah. you argued instead for a kind of recommitment to free trade and free markets as the best means of achieve, uh, maintaining the West's innovation advantage over China. What do those calling for uh, a, a new economic uh, agenda get wrong? And why do you think uh, a, a yeah. recommitment to uh, conventional economic thinking is the right way to stay ahead of China in this economic race? I don't know how people can look at a society that has built 50 million unused, unnecessary housing units, um, uh, and whose project for economic growth is to build unnecessary housing units and then tear them down and then build them again. Uh, let's say that's that's the future. That's we want to be more like that. Um, look, I industrial policy. Um, there is one of those things that maybe on a blackboard you can make it look like something that might be a good idea. I personally doubt it, but maybe you could. Then you have to bump into the fact of the way democratic government actually works. Um, I, my, my most recent article for The Atlantic was about America, one of America's most ambitious experiments in industrial policy, ethanol. Uh, and, and you think that's what you're going to get. You're going to get more ethanol programs. And just to give you an idea of, of, of how, of the costs of that, um, we've been reading a lot during this, this terrible war in, in Ukraine about how Russia and Ukraine together uh, provide almost 30% of the world's wheat exports. You think, how'd that happen? 
Well, the answer to how that happened is 20 years ago, actually, not even. The United States provided a quarter of world wheat exports. Today, it provides about 13%. Why? Because the United States, pursuing its ethanol policy, and they started with subsidies and they moved to just absolute requirements that uh, uh, all gasoline must have 10% ethanol blended into it. So you don't need a subsidy because you make people buy it. You make, them, you make the customer, the end user pay for it. So that converted millions of acres of American farmland from wheat to corn to be turned into motor fuel and also animal feed, um, which is making us sick and making, um, uh, making antibiotics work less well, but that's, that's another uh, set of issues. Um, all in order to um, make meet assumptions about what the future of the motor fuel industry would look like that have turned out to be wrong. America is now the world's largest producer of of gas uh, of of oil and natural gas, um, and can be completely self sufficient in gasoline if it wants to be, um, with with or without ethanol. So just. It's not going to work. Uh, it's going to be captured. Uh, you have to deal with the economy as it is. And meanwhile, we have been living through in the past 20 years this extraordinary era of, of innovation of, of all kinds. And post-COVID, we're about to see another, which is a huge reorientation in the way we use um, urban space as more and more people spend more and more time at home. Um, and I just think you have, you have to go with your strengths, not your weaknesses. And the strengths of market economies, of democracies, is dynamism, innovation. Um, and one of the weaknesses, we're not that good at economic planning. And that should caution us against the temptation to indulge something that usually turns out to be a hideous disaster. It's notable, for instance, that at the end of the day, it was American ingenuity um, that produced the, the COVID-19 vaccine and not Chinese state state planning. Um, um, it was American so ingenuity working with partners and being open to the world because I think the first of the vaccines was developed by um, uh, Germans of Turkish origin working in, uh, the, in, in a, a lab company that worked in development with an American manufacturing company, Pfizer, and then other approaches were, came along the same way. Um, and you know, the, the, the planning approach would have been to say, let's pick a lab and have, you know, give them resources and do it their way and see how it happens. Um, I, I, I remember um, during one of the last of these scares, uh, uh, in, in when the scare was Japan, somebody wrote a book uh, called More Like Us. And the answer was, even if you admired some things about the way a different society solved its problems, they were not necessarily, even if you admire, they were not necessarily replicable in your society. And that the way your society developed was to build on its own strengths. And the strengths of the North American economy have always been dynamism, innovation, competition, and em embracing that. Um, it doesn't always work perfectly, but um, it works better than planning. And it certainly is going to work better for us than planning is going to work. Let, let me ask about a, a weakness of our societies these days. Um, last year, I went back and read George Kennan's famous long telegram, and I was struck that his main point was less about the particularities of defense and foreign policy and more about the self-confidence and vigor of our own societies. Do you have any thoughts, David, about how a, a new U.S.-China rivalry may actually help to sort of pull us out of our collective stupor? Can it be a catalyst for a renewed commitment to the innovation, dynamism, and energy um, that you're talking about? Yeah. I don't I, We're mindful that we're recording this in the, in the middle of, of March of – uh, 2022, um, watching democratic Ukraine beat back, um, an invading Russian army, um, and uh, assisted by this extraordinary eruption of aid from, from the Western democracies acting together. And I, I look at this and think this is a moment to actually rediscover the strengths of our democratic way of life, of our, um, of our open market society that, we have been inundated for a long time. It's been um, with accusations that we are decadent, that our things aren't working, that we're not the people our parents and grandparents were. And by the way, during our parents and grandparents' time, there are similar writers saying that they weren't the people that their parents and grandparents were. And so it is back to the ancient Greeks that were always being told, think, think, you know, things were better before we showed up. Um, I, I just think it's an illusion. And what we've discovered is um, that a lot of the strengths of democratic societies are, are latent. They're, they're, they're waiting for when you need them. And most of the time, the, the greatest strength of it is our endless self-criticism. Um, and all the complaining we do is not a mark of how 
it, it, it's actually it's like a silhouette. The complaining tells you about the strengths. Um, and it's the societies that are always thumping their chests and um, that are actually the societies that turn out to be brittle and weak and that fail at the moment of competition. Um, you, you mentioned the, the, the Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, I have to ask um, about recent reports that the Russians have asked the Chinese government to provide weapons and other support. Yet yeah. the signs thus far are that the Chinese aren't keen to assist. What do you make of that? Have these Western expressions of cooperation and solidarity in support of Ukraine uh, had the added benefit yeah. of reminding China that we're less decadent and more capable than it might have thought? Yeah, also a uh, couple of practical questions, which is um, the Chinese don't do things for charity. So how are the Russians going to pay for this aid? Um, their resources are all locked up. Um, I mean, they've got a bunch of gold. Are they going to put that on a train and send it, send it eastward from Moscow to Beijing, um, guarded by what, an army division to, uh, to, to uh, move the gold? And if the gold is moving east, how do the Chinese supplies move? Um, you know, that uh, – are they going to ship them to Russia and pay the insurance? Are they going to, are they going to send them by rail across Siberia? It's not much of a rail connection. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the Russian talk only demonstrates the extent to which they haven't thought things through. And the time to buy the rations your army needs for a long war is before the war, not in the middle of the war. Um, I, I think that long before Chinese help, if it is forthcoming, if it is paid for, can reach the Russians, their army is going to begin to disintegrate. Mm. And then they're going to face... Um, the horrible choice and the whole world will face the horrible choice that their doctrine calls for what they euphemistically call escalate to de-escalate, which means use weapons of mass destruction, including potentially so-called low yield nuclear weapons as a way to frighten people into giving them what they want and fail to achieve on the battlefield. So that, that's what, what I'm worried about. I think from the Chinese point of view, I think the question they have to be asking themselves. So they look at the Russian war in Ukraine and say, would this, war go better or worse if they'd had to cross dozens of miles of open water in order to get to Ukraine. Um, and uh, it's very sober. I think anyone thinking about using violence against Taiwan has to be very sobered by the experience of watching the Russians try to use violence against Ukraine. The, um, the article to which I referred earlier, your May 2021 um, essay about um, the West and China, talked a bit about um, Chinese demographics um, mm -hmm. and the extent to which um, that would put downward pressure on the country's ability to compete militarily, economically, and so on. Do you want to just talk a bit about yeah. um, the extent to which uh, demographics are destiny? And, um, and this is a piece of the puzzle that too often those in the West who, are, who kind of talk up China uh, fail yeah. to account for. Well, this has been a longstanding question about China. Will China get old before it gets rich. Um, uh, wealthy societies can cope with um, aging, or the, the increase in the average age of the population in a, in a bunch of ways. One is they can pay for safety nets. Um, uh, they can afford it. Um, second, they can also um, keep people working longer because they more and more of the work of developed societies is work that older people can do. It's less physical. Mm. You can substitute machines for people. Um, and so keep people, even if their bodies aren't as strong as they were 15 or 20 years ago, on the job um, into their 60s and 70s. And that's been very much the success of Japan. Also, you're attractive to immigration. Um, and uh, you can cope with immigration, uh, which, again, China has, has trouble with. So uh, China had this um, crackdown on uh, childbearing. Um, they, uh, they'd had, they'd, the Mao Zedong regime had early encouraged huge increases in, child, uh, in childbearing um, without much thought to how people were going to support uh, this vast new population. They drove the population to above a billion people. Um, that On the way there, they panicked, imposed the one-child policy, and um, easy and recommended and sometimes even nearly compulsory abortion. Um, and now they find themselves with a population that is lopsidedly male because the people who are allowed only one child often chose boys um, and and rapidly aging without the material infrastructure. You know, as always with these things, you, you ever say, look, everyone's got problems, but you got to like our problems better than you like their problems. Hmm. Um, that, that's 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 a fascinating observation. Um if I can wrap up, David, with just a couple of questions about what all this means for Canada. Um, in a world of uh, growing geopolitical and technological rivalry between the U.S. and China, what advice would you have for Canadian policymakers? How can we navigate these tensions between our yeah. first and second largest trading partners? Um, 
again, I think Canada can look back on a record of, of, of considerable success. The people who, um, uh, divide, who, who built the U.S. Canada Free Trade Agreement, built NAFTA, got Canada into an integrated, a much more integrated North American economy. Um, where Canada specializes in various ways. I mean, people will, will compare this or that aspect of Canadian life and say the Americans have more of this. But that's, that's as absurd as uh, looking at the state of New York and saying, you know, New York is not sufficient in food products. You know, you're in, that integration mean, drives specialization. That's how trade works. And Canada specializes in, in a variety of ways. Canada is also st specialized, by the way, in political and social stability. It's not just that uh, economic specialization. Um, so Canadian life has been a little less dynamic in some ways, a little bit less innovative in some ways in American life, but it's also offered um, uh, more assurances to people. And that, that again, has encouraged a kind of certain kinds of work get done in Canada. Um, you know, the banking system has historically, for example, been much more reliable and stable and less prone to disaster than the American banking system. Um, so I think Canadians can look back on a, a record of success. And as um, the world now ad adjusts to climate challenges, um, Canada can, uh, I think one of the things Canada needs to think about is making sure that the Western world draws the widest possible carbon border around itself. Um, certainly around, you, you, I mean, at a minimum, you want to think about a NAFTA carbon price. Ideally, you want to think about um, a, pa a transatlantic carbon price. Um, and the larger that block, the more that the developed world can impose uh, climate solutions on people who don't volunteer for those solutions like China, like India, um, and uh, make China absorb the carbon price, whether it will or not. Um, the, the, as you know, David, the current government was elected with some ambitions around uh, bilateral free trade negotiations with China. Those have, have mostly been shelved, in, at least in response to um, yeah. public sentiments in, in the aftermath of the unlawful detentions of the two Michaels. Yeah. Uh, we're now seeing a kind of 180 where the government is talking about uh, a new round of foreign inve possible foreign investment restrictions in certain sectors, um, rethinking um, post-secondary partnerships between Canadian yeah. universities and Chinese ones. I mean, I guess my at a big picture level, how should we think about our ongoing relationship with China? Um, do we kind of double down on integration and cooperation, or are there some parts of the economy and society uh, where after, you know, 20 years of, of seeing how the relationship has played out, do we need to revisit some of yeah. those uh, early assumptions? Well, there was a lot of grandiosity about the early days of the uh, Justin Trudeau government about what was possible. Um, uh, I, I, my own view is, and this has always been, this is a long-running debate in Canadian society, and my view is maybe the the one that is more controversial in um, debate, but more effective in operation, which is that Canada will do better uh, to negotiate with with China as part of a NAFTA bloc uh, than it will on its own. Um, and Canada is just ha you have to be cognizant of the uh, size of Canadian population and the size of of the Canadian economy. Canada is an extraordinarily successful and wealthy society for its size. But size matters. Um, and uh, so if you want to change China's behavior in the ways that Canadians um, care about most, Canada alone doesn't have the leverage to do that. But the NAFTA bloc does. And Canada should be an active promoter of um, more policy cohesion um, and uh, with both uh, with, uh, with trade issues and climate issues. The last thing I would say is on, on the issue, we also need to be realistic about, about human rights, that uh, – as individuals, um, as civil society, we care passionately about those issues and we need always to talk about them. But there's a, a difference between what governments can achieve in this area when dealing with a country as big and powerful as China. Um, and so more realism about um, the government to government aspect of, of, of the human rights dialogue is not to give up on human rights. It's just to say it need, that the human rights effort needs to be located where it can be successful. And that is in civil society, um, individual action, NGOs, not government to government relations, where um, China will always regard the human rights portfolio as ex an existential threat to its authoritarian, harsh regime. And we will never regard human rights as, ex as a, a, in China as existential for ourselves. So let's just be realistic about that. Locate the drive for human rights where it can do good. Well, David, I think that's a, a good place to wrap up a fascinating conversation as we mark the, the two-year anniversary of lockdowns on COVID-19. You know, 
we've talked in previous episodes the long-lasting implications of this experience, and, and it, it seems to me that the, the West's relationship with China will be only one of those. In, in, in future episodes, we maybe will take on some of the others, including health care and the economy and so on. But for now, thank you so much uh, for joining me for another episode of, of Hub Dialogues, and look forward to catching up in a couple of weeks.